Okay, so in our uh, in section 1.1, 1 .1, uh, one of our focuses was on difference between a population and a sample. Uh, uh, in this section, section 1.2, we're going to focus more on the uh, path on sampling. Um, we'll talk about different types of sample, uh, different ty uh, types of techniques of sampling, um, but we'll talk mostly just about taking random samples. Um, so to start, let's begin with a basic definition of a simple random sample. So a simple random sample of n measurements from a population is a subset of the population selected in such a manner that every sample of size n from the population has an equal chance of being selected. And it doesn't just include every sample of that size, it's every sample of the specified size and every individual of the population that have an equal chance of being selected. Now, uh, the only caveat between that, is, the only caveat of, from that definition is just because every individual has an equal chance to be selected in the sample doesn't mean it's a simple random sample, okay? We have to make sure that every sample of the same size from the population has an equal chance of being selected. Here's some important features of a simple random sample. So, like we said, every sample of specified size and from the population has an equal chance of being selected. Um, but also a good, uh, a good uh, advantage of using a simple random sample is that there's no research or bias that occurs in the items selected for the sample. Um, as, we move on to, as we move on in this section and then in section 1.3 where it talks about experimental design, we have to begin to be very careful about uh, not making as many errors as possible. We'll get to errors towards the end of this section but um, one of the errors that may come up is bias, and bias can come from the materials that we, uh, that we use to conduct the study. It can come from the setting of the study. Even the individuals that we study could, be, could contain some kind of bias. But in conducting a simple random sample, we get no researcher bias in those items. But a disadvantage of that is that a random sample may not always reflect the diversity of the population. So let's say that I'm uh, pulling a random sample from, uh, from a, a room of 10 cats and dogs, uh, uh, like 10 total animals, right? Let's say I pull a, so a sample of size 6, right? Uh, now, every combination and permutation of those 6 cats and dogs uh, are, has an equal chance of being selected. But let's say I choose 6 cats, or let's say I, say, I, let's say I choose 6 dogs. If that's the case, then the data from that sample might not reflect the diversity of that population. Like the sample itself may not reflect the diversity of population and the data that comes from it may not reflect the uh, data from the population too. And we talked about this when we talked about difference between population and sample. Uh, data from a sample is not complete compared to a, uh, data from a population because the data in a sample varies from group to group, from sample to sample. So a random sample may not always reflect the diversity of the population. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. You just got to be careful on how we conduct that sample. So here's an example. Let's say that um, let's say that I want to know if the emission system of a bunch of Toyotas satisfy pollution control standards. So let's say I want to pick a random sample of 30 cars from a population of 500 cars. Here's how we do that. One of the ways that we can do that is with what's called a random number table. Now, before I get to that, let's go ahead and talk about how we're going to set this up. First, we're going to assign each car a different number between 1 and 500. Okay, it doesn't matter what particular order we put those numbers in. We just got to make sure each of those numbers, each one of those cars has a number between 1 and 500. Okay, then we use the random number table to choose the sample. Now, your textbook, uh, your textbook appendix has... Your textbook appendix has a, an, an, has a uh, random number table, and here's, uh, here's the first page of it. Uh, there's two pages, but for in the purposes of this example, we only need, uh, we only need one, uh, one of those pages. So we're going to need this for this example. All right, so the table in the appendix has 50 rows and 10 columns, and of course, the dimensions of that allow, allow you to have 500 numbers, and each of those numbers is five digits each. All right, so we're going to begin by picking, uh, picking a random spot on, the ta on, on that table. So let's say I take a pen, like I'm talking about a bobby pin with the little rubber ball on the top. Let's say I drop a pen on the table and the head of the pen lands on row 15, 
column five. Well, I'm going to go to my table. I'm going to look for the 15th row. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Oh, I'm sorry, I went too far ahead. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay, this is my row. And I want the fifth column. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Right here. That's the number that I'm going to start with. 99281. All right, so I'm going to start here. And I'm going to get as many of these five-digit numbers as possible. Okay, so I want. Let's say I want thirty. So I want. I want. Uh, I want to pick thirty cars. Let's pick until we get 30, 30 digits. Five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Okay. Now, if I need more, I'll go to the next row and add more digits. Add more digits from the numbers on the next row. So here are those thirty digits. Those six num five digit numbers. Okay. Next, since the highest number assigned to a car is 500, and of course 500 is a three digit number, we're going to regroup our digits into blocks of three. So if we go back to, if we go back to these five digit numbers, okay, I'm going to mark off every three digits. So I got these three digits here these three digits here, these three digits here, and so on, and so forth, okay? Until I have however many I think I need. And again, I can go back to the table and add more digits, okay? So when that happens, this is what I'm left with. That's what I'm left with. So to construct our random sample, we're going to use the first 30 cars we encounter on that random number table at that same position that we started at. Now here's the problem. We numbered the cars from 1 to 500. So I'm not going to use any number that's greater than 500. So in this example, I'm not going to use 992. I'm not going to use 815. I'm not going to use 964. I am going to use 15, 221. I'm not going to use this number or that number or that number. I am going to use this number and this number. Obviously, I'm going to need more numbers. So I'm going to keep going until I get until I get my 30, my 30 three-digit numbers between 1 and 500. Now, let's say, let's say that I am going, let's say I keep going, and I let's say I get to the 25th number and I end up with another 105. Well, I've already used 105, and because I've already used 105, I can't use it again. So, I'm, so any number that's repeated, you just skip it and then move on to the next one, okay? So to get the rest of the cards in the sample, we continue to the next line of the random number table, get those three, get three groups of three digits each, and we're going to keep going until I get my 30 uh, numbers. And once we encounter a number we used before, we skip it. So to recap, when we draw a random sample, we number all the members of the population in sequential order. We use a table, a calculator, or a computer to select random numbers from those numbers assigned to the population members. Okay. And so what that means is we don't have to use the random number table. We can use a calculator. We can use a computer. Right? There are computer programs specifically designed and websites specifically designed to generate random numbers. Um, anytime I come up with a quiz or a, twist or a quiz or a test that has a matching section, I randomize the order of the potential answers based off of a random number generating website. And then we create the sample by using population members with those numbers corresponding to those randomly selected. What it really boils down to it is just pulling names out of a hat. That's really all a simple random sample is. Now, going back to the uh, random number table, again, you don't have to use it, but it does ha actually have other uses, like in simulations. A simulation is a numerical representation of a real-world phenomenon. And we see simulations in things like nuclear reactors, cloud formation, uh, general medical science, highway design, production control, shipbuilding, even something as complex as war games. And if you don't know what war games are, it's, it's a tool that governments use to simulate different scenarios in war. Our government uses it. I'm pretty sure other governments use it. But in, in that type of simulation, they use a random number table. 
Now, other than random sampling, they have other sampling techniques that we're going to cover. We'll talk about each one, talk about the process for each one, and we'll talk about the pros and cons for each one. All right. So the first one is the stratified sampling, then systematic sampling, cluster sampling, multi-stage sampling, and convenience sampling. Starting with stratified sampling, so in stratified sampling, we divide the entire population into distinct subgroups or strata. Now, strata is a plural is a plural word. The singular form of it is called stratum. The strata are based on specific characteristics such as age, income, education level, etc. So that so the strata are technically uh, ways to either quantitatively or qualitatively uh, put things into categories, right? Now, all members of each stratum have to share that specific characteristic. So the way that you, so the way that we work on stratified sampling is first we divide the population into it at least two distinct strata. You have to have at least two different ones. Then a random sample of a certain size is drawn from each stratum. So you make sure make sure with each random sample, uh, make, with each random sample, make sure it's the same number across each stratum. And then the information obtained is carefully adjusted in all resulting calculations. Okay, so an example of using a stratified sample is population of undergrad students. Um, if I wanted to create stratum, I could separate them by uh, I could separate them by age. I could separate them by classification, like freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, uh, student app. I could uh, I could separate them based off of um, I can separate them based off of uh, what student organizations they're in. Are they in student government? Are they in student programming? Are they on, uh, are they on, uh, on the debate team? Are they in esports? Are they a uh, student athlete? Are they in cheerleading? Are they in band? All kinds of different strata that we can use. All right. uh, then we get to systematic sampling. In systematic sampling, you number all the members from the population sequentially. So kind of like what we did with that random number a uh, random sample example with the cars. Then from a starting point selected at random, include every kth member or every nth member of the population in the sample. So once we put that, all the elements of the population in some natural sequential order, we're gonna pick a random starting point, just like we did with the car example, where we started at that one random number, and we're gonna select every kth element or every nth element for our sample. So let's say that I'm, I put the 500 cars in that numerical order, I start at a random car, and I pick, let's say I pick every seventh car after that. I pick every seventh car after that for our random sample. Uh, or, for example, we're people lining up to buy concert tickets. So if I'm conducting a systematic sampling using people who buy Taylor Swift tickets, uh, I could start at a random point and choose every seventh person that bought uh, tickets to a Taylor Swift concert. Um, now, when it comes to systematic sampling, uh, the advantage of a systematic sample is that it's very, it's pretty easy to get. Uh, however, when you use systematic sampling, if the population is repetitive or cyclical in any way, uh, then the systematic sampling shouldn't be used. Like, for example, if, um, if, a, if you're talking about a fabric mill that produces dress material, and the loom that produces the material makes a mistake every 17th yard, but we check only every 16th yard with an automatic electronic scanner, a random starting point may or may not uh, result in the detection of those flaws uh, before a large amount of fabric is produced. So if your population is cyclic or repetitive, systematic sampling may not be the best way to go. Then we have cluster sampling. In cluster sampling, we divide the entire population into pre-existing segments called clusters. The clu these clusters are often geometric in nature. Then we're, going to make a, uh, then we're going to make a random selection of clusters where we include every member of each selected cluster in that sample. <clears throat> so again, when we, when we use cluster sampling, we start by dividing the demographic area into different sections. Then we randomly select sections or clusters, and every member of that cluster is included in that sample. Uh, so, for example, uh, a lot of government agencies and private research organizations use cluster sampling. Um, and, for example, let's say you're conducting a survey of school children in a large city, like, like New Orleans, right? Um, 
that would so you might pick different clusters based off of different schools. Let's say I pick this a cluster from this school. Well, every single person in that school is included in that sample. Uh, the only downside to using a uh, the only downside to using cluster sampling is that it's not the best way to go, especially if your population is very large or very geographically spread out. Like for example, you might have a, you might have a better time looking at clusters like schools in New Orleans as opposed to schools in bigger cities like Los Angeles or New York. Okay, um, if your population is a little too large or too geographically spread out, multi-stage sampling is probably the way to go. So multi-stage sampling uses a variety of sampling methods to create successively smaller groups at each stage. And that final sample consists of clusters. So like I said, if, you're, if you have a very large or very geographically spread out populations, maybe multi-stage sampling is the right one to use for you. Um, like for example, the, uh, the current US population survey interviews 60,000 households across the United States. That's a huge geographical area to cover. So multi-stage sampling might actually be might actually be a better way to go. The last sampling technique is called convenience sampling. Now convenience sampling creates a sample by using data from population members that are readily available. And the good the, the pros about convenience sampling is that they're very convenient and readily available. And even sometimes they may it may be the only it may be the only um, it may be the only data that you have available or that's that's out there. Um, However, when we talk about convenience sampling, convenience sampling runs the risk of being very biased. Here's an example. Let's say a news, let's say a news uh, reporter is getting opinions of the people about a particular topic like a proposed seat tax to be imposed on tickets to all sporting events. And let's say the revenues from that tax will be used to support the local symphony. Well, if a news person is getting opinions of the people outside of the symphony hall, right as people are coming out of a concert, those people already have some sort of in, uh, some sort of bias regarding that the uses of that tax. So, convenience sampling, while it's convenient and readily available, it definitely runs the risk of being very biased. Um, another example of convenience sampling is maybe like doing a survey about a new flavor of coffee in a coffee house. Okay. So those are the five met Those are the five different sampling techniques. Uh, so we have to be careful to as I mentioned earlier, to try to eliminate as much bias as humanly possible. Um, and that's where, we, that's where we have to take into account where we're pulling from. That's where a sampling frame comes in. So a sampling frame is a list of individuals, all from which a sample was actually selected. Ideally, we want the sampling frame to be the entire population. It's not going to happen like that every single time. Sometimes it's because realistically, not, maybe not all the members of the population are accessible like for example in the phone book right if I'm pulling a if I'm pulling a sample from people in the phone book not every single member of the population is in a phone book I mean who really uses a phone book nowadays right anytime that we omit uh, people from uh, members of the population from a sam the sampling frame it's called under coverage right under coverage results from omitting member population members from the sample frame in other words the sample frame doesn't necessarily match the population. Like, for example, in the phone book, you know, you're not going to find homeless people in the phone book. You're, not gonna, you're probably not going to find fugitives in the phone book either. Okay? Um, so, sometimes, so even when we have under coverage or not, we have to be careful about our, random, our sample because we may end up with things like sampling errors or non-sampling errors. Let me explain the difference between the two. A sampling error is the difference between the measurements from a sample and corresponding measurements from the respective population. It's caused by the fact that the sample does not perfectly represent the population. Uh, a non-sampling error is the result of poor sample design, sloppy data collection, faulty measuring instruments, bias in questionnaires, so on and so forth. So the difference between the two is that sampling errors don't necessarily mean mistakes, right? All it just means is that it's probably more appropriate to use a population instead of a sample, right? We talked about the... Uh, we talked about um, the example of studying teens in America who drink soda, right? If we try to use a population, we may end up with sampling errors because it may not perfectly represent the population or, or, or 
uh, we may end up with, if we, I'm sorry, if we go with a sample instead of a population, which in that case, it would be more appropriate to use a sample. The drawback to that is the sample may not, re may not perfectly represent the population, but you know what, that's okay. That's okay. If that's the case, then maybe we just need to pull it back and start using population instead, right? If we're looking at, uh, if we were looking at the Mount Everest example, we're studying people who climb Mount Everest. If we're taking a sample instead of a population, again, samples change from uh, data from samples change from group to group. It does not represent the diversity of the population or the fixed the fixed nature of the data that comes from population. So sampling errors are there to just tell us, hey, maybe we should use populations instead. Doesn't mean our data is wrong. It just means that maybe we need to look a little bit larger. Non-sampling errors are what we absolutely need to avoid at all costs, because that's a result of, like I, like I said, poor sample design, sloppy data collection, and faulty measuring in instruments, bias in questionnaires, bias in the people that we're interviewing, and so on and so forth. So sampling errors are okay. Non-sampling errors we want to try to eliminate as much as possible. 